Hey, what's going on, everyone? Before we get into our conversation, I want to let you know this podcast is sponsored by BetRivers.com. BetRivers.com, the best place for all your sports gambling needs. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. You can also watch all of these episodes on the Field of 68 YouTube channel. Now, let's get into our conversation. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Eric Devendorf, your host of the Scores Table podcast. And today we have on another great guest. But before I introduce this guest, I just want to say this guy was one of the hardest workers. And and I knew it right away um, when he stepped foot on campus. I remember him coming to work out with me. uh, It was just 100 percent through the whole workout. uh, And he earned everything, um, you know, where he's at right now. He earned it. uh, One of the hardest workers that I've seen and one of the greatest shooters to, to come through QS. Um, so I really appreciate you coming on, Cole. Uh, Cole Schweider, thank you, man. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. I just, like I said, man, it's, or like we all know, I mean, the QS family is so strong. Uh, I wouldn't miss an opportunity to come out, come on and uh, help your podcast. Hope you come on my podcast. I just started a podcast, The Cole Schweider Show, and uh, we get a little, we get a little joint episode. No, absolutely. I've I've been checking it out, man. I know you and Patty have uh, been hitting the podcast pretty hard. So, yeah, bro, you already know. Whenever you want me on, I'm there. Oh yeah, I appreciate it. So, first off, man, let's uh just talk about uh your injury a little bit. I know you're uh you had a little stress fracture in your foot. Just kind of talk about how that's coming along, and um you know the timetable for that. Yeah, man. So uh the, the injury was actually funny. So I actually had no pain going into it. So uh going into the preseason for the NBA. They obviously have you do your preseason physicals. So for uh, they had me do an MRI at the beginning of the preseason, um, and and basically they, they do the knees and, and feet because those are the two most dangerous areas for basketball players. So my uh, my trainer calls me. He's like, "Hey Cole, like, do, how's your foot? How's your right foot feeling?" I'm like, "Fine." You know what I mean? He's like, "We well, have a stress reaction in your right navicular bone, which is the bone that connects your foot and ankle together." So I was like, "All right." So I went back to the CAT scan. Uh, CAT scan came back fine. So they made me sit out a week, and then I, I played in training camp with uh, the stress reaction. Actually, they let me play because I didn't have any pain. Uh, they wanted to see if it was just like, just like a one-off. They added some new treatments and stuff like that throughout my regiment. Um, so played in training camp with it, but they're like they they reevaluated me after a month. It came back a lot worse than it did the first time. Still had no pain. So basically, they put me in a boot for two weeks. Uh, two weeks uh, out of the boot, but couldn't do any jumping, moving, just lifting. Um, and then the past two weeks, I've been getting on the court, getting, getting better and better. So it's been about six weeks since I've been out. So uh, should have about two weeks left. I'm um, scheduled, to, scheduled to play right now for December 14th. So um, t- two weeks left, but I'm, I'm biting at the bit, man. You know, you know how we get. We, we, we're, uh, it, it's tough for me to sit down and, and, and not work out two, three times a day and, and have, have that normal routine and schedule. So um, it's definitely, it's definitely been weird, but just, just anxious and, and ready to get back out there. Absolutely. So I'm going to bring it back real quick, bro. Um, I kind of want you to talk about, uh, you know, you growing up and, and really how you got interested in basketball and who was really the one who kind of pushed the game on you uh, and, and started you to get involved with it. Yeah, so both my parents played Division One. My dad played at Fordham University. My mom played at University of New Hampshire. My dad's six eight. My mom's six three. So it, the for me to play basketball it was just always just it was it was put into my life at such a young age. My dad always says the first thing that I touched was a basketball. You know what I mean? He he made sure that that, that was a thing. But um, my parents started the youth basketball league in town, and, and and the reason why my dad really wanted to get that going is that we could have gym access whenever we wanted. Uh, we go to the gym. We could shoot. We could. I'd be in the gym all day scoring games. I'd, I'd be helping out the refs, giving them water, like anything I could do. And I just fell in love with the game from from such a young age. And um, I just remember I was I was that kid who, who would cry after a loss. I was that kid who would um, be upset at my teammates if they missed the pass just because I was so competitive and wanted to win. Um, and, and yeah, man, so just from a really young age, I, I just really fell in love with the game. I remember when I was like eight or nine years old, I started crying after my after my basketball season was over. So, <laughs> um, my dad let me play AAU when I was like nine or ten years old, uh, just because just he saw like how like how sad I was after basketball season. So, I mean, it was from a young age, and I've just loved the grind and process ever since. It's kind of crazy because it's kind of similar to to how I was growing up. You know, at a young age, I, I really was able to find out that 
you know, I love to play basketball. And, and you know, for a lot of kids growing up, it, you know, they play multiple sports and, and they don't really know, you know, what sport they want to do until later, you know, in, in middle school or, or in high school. I guess what age for you um, did you really know, like, all right, this is this is what I want to do. I want to become a really good basketball player um, and I want to make it my career. Probably that day when I started crying after my basketball season, I knew I loved it. Um, <laughs> when when I when I thought it was realistic for it to be my career, I think that's like a, a lot longer down the line. But when, when when I loved it, when I knew I wanted to play in the NBA, it was when I was eight, nine years old. Like I, my dream was always to make it to the NBA. My dream was always to play at big time college universities at like a Syracuse or obviously I played at Villanova as well. Like that was always my goal. That was always my dream. And, and me and my dad kind of shared that. Because my dad actually, um, he stopped playing after his freshman year of college. Uh, like, and after that, like, I, I think that he kind of had like this this sense of like, all right, like I I couldn't make it to the level that I wanted to. So like, me, I'm, he he doesn't live his dream through me, but it definitely helps. Like, it's definitely an amazing feeling for him just to kind of see how, how I yeah, grew. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely, no doubt, bro. Talk talk about um your recruitment process because you were you were highly recruited um you went to a, a great high school um yeah. and, and a lot of those guys from your high school we had who came from there i think demetrius nichols um, yep so we you, know, you got that you got that syracuse pipeline already um, but you went to villanova first so so just talk about your recruitment in high school uh, when it really started to heat, heat up and you know kind of what that process was like for you yeah, man, I, I got my first offer when I was a first uh, when I was a freshman in high school from Boston College, and uh, after that, it just slowly started growing. Um, I think I really started getting big time offers. Was, was my uh, my junior fall? I started getting some high major offers. My sophomore summer, I actually came up to Syracuse for an elite camp. I tell this story to, to Reddit G back all the time. I hate when I bring it up, but I remember coming up for elite camp. Syracuse, obviously, the Syracuse pipeline with, with St. Andrews and Mike Carter Williams, Demetrius Nichols, two guys from Syracuse make the NBA. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, I go there and I, and I kill it. I kill it, man. I, I thought I was one of the best players there. Um, and and at the time, Hop was taking over for Coach Beheim. So Coach Beheim was just there, just just meeting people, but he wasn't out there looking because Coach Coach Hop was going to take over as a head coach. So after the camp, like me and GMAC are talking, GMAC's like, hold on, hold on, I'm gonna get Hop for you. So I'm thinking, oh shoot, they're about to offer me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hop's like, Hop's like man, like I, I I love the way you play. Like, let's, let's schedule an unofficial visit for the fall. So I'm like, all right, like this stinks. And then later on Twitter, I see a bunch of guys <laughs> offered on on uh on elite camp, which it stunk, but I mean I was I was thrilled to obviously get that, but that definitely motivated me. Um so that fall I got I got more and more offers. Um, and then my, at the end of my junior year, um, Hop takes a job at Washington. Um, he actually offered me a scholarship that, that year, but I was down to Syracuse, Villanova, Duke, and Xavier were my top four. Um, took official visits to all of them. You were on my official visit at Syracuse. Yeah, I remember. I remember, bro. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, man, it was, it was a really tough decision, but at the end of the day, like for, for me, um, it was just a feel thing for me. Like I, I loved all, all four schools, all four schools I could see myself having successful careers at. Um, but I just, at the time I felt like Villanova was the best option for me. Obviously what, like uh, it didn't go as planned, but at, at the time it was like, they just won a national championship. Co coach Ray's an amazing coach. They had four guys go to the NBA that year. Um, it's, it's an amazing culture, amazing um, basketball community that they have at Villanova. So, uh, yeah, at the time, I just thought Villanova was the best opportunity for me. But the recruiting process was crazy, you know what I mean? Like, I talked to GMAC for two years. I talked to Luke Murray at Xavier for two years. Like, John Shaw was recruiting me hard at Duke. So it was, a, it was a tough process. But at the end of the day, I just felt like Villanova at the time was the best opportunity for me. Yeah, I mean, you look at those schools, you really can't go wrong with whatever one you pick. And, and then when you get there, you know, things happen as far as like, you know, fit in the system, whatever it is. What you, yeah. Looking back, would you had went to Syracuse for four years if, instead of, you know, doing those few years at, at Villanova and then going to Syracuse or you would have just kept it how it is? Man, I, I don't, I believe everything happens for a reason. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think me going to Villanova was so big in my maturity process. I mean, you know, at, at Syracuse, Coach Beheim lets you 
let, lets you make decisions on your own. Like he's not gonna he's not gonna hound you and and, and be on you. But you, you really develop becoming a pro at Syracuse. If you want to get in the gym, you're gonna get in the gym. Yeah, you're, you're gonna hit up all these people. Cabellus is gonna be at, at your disposal. But at Villanova, it's like a military mindset. Like in the summer, it's six a.m. lift, uh, seven thirty shooting, eight thirty class, then. 8 30 to like in the summer the class is long so 8 30 to like 11 30 class and 12 o'clock practice 12 12 to 2 o'clock practice and then you have study hall after that so like your, your days and then you don't get back into your rooms like five or six and then you got to wake up at 5 30 the next morning wow. like everything i'm doing over is just built to built to win built to create habits our practices are three hours long our film sessions are an hour and a half long our, when we're breaking down scouting reports to take our phones the night before games you know what i mean it's, it's just a wow. It's just a very like diligent process. So at Villanova, it taught me how to become a pro. It taught me how to get to practice an hour early, get to lifts 30 minutes before. Everyone gets taped every single day. So at Villanova, it taught me how to be a pro. Obviously, the man-to-man -man defense, I think, helped help me for this level, just, just learning, learning that. Um, but yeah, man, I I think looking back at it, if I went to Syracuse, would I have had a better career? I I, I think so. But I think in terms of um, me becoming the best player at the end of the day. I think learning from both Coach Beheim and Coach Wright, like who can who can go wrong with that? No, two Hall of Famers, bro. I mean, yeah, to be able to experience both of those coaching styles, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a no-brainer. And then, like you said, it's kind of night and day from Villanova to Syracuse because you get to Syracuse and it's almost like, wow, you got all this freedom. And, and sometimes guys can't handle that that type yeah. of freedom you know what i mean because you could really do whatever you want coach isn't the, like you said he's not the guy to baby you or or just be on you he kind of just expects you to already know what to do you know what yeah. i mean you got g mac and red and grip they're they'll help you along for sure but even then like those guys are expecting you to be in the gym get your shots get your lift go to class come to practice early stay after like you know it's like it's like a pro mentality right like these guys where you're at now you know, these coaches and these, they have families, you know, they have kids. So, you know, they're, they're in and out. I mean, they're not going to be calling your phone 24 hours a day to make sure you're doing your work. It's up to you to get that work in. So uh, I, I think that it's an incredible answer. You, you learn that the, the commitment, the sacrifice, the discipline at Villanova, and then at Syracuse, you were able to learn how to handle that type of freedom, which will, which prepares you for that next level where you're at right now. So um yeah. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense, man. So kind of let's, let's talk about Cuse, man, your time at Cuse. Um, you know, just give me your, your overall experience, you know, playing there, playing in the Dome. We all know how the community supports, you know, uh, wholeheartedly. And then just talk about playing for Coach Beheim and, and you know, what that was like. Yeah, my uh, – I, I get emotional when thinking about it because I had such an amazing experience at Syracuse uh, – I'm just such a believer in the program and everything that the program stands for. And I honestly, I, I credit my, me being in the NBA to, to, obviously it's a lot of hard work, but to Syracuse, man, like I, Coach Boeheim, GMAC, all those guys, they revived my college career. I was a six man at Villanova and, and just fighting to get on the court. And then I come to Syracuse and they treat me like one of the main guys, one of the guys who's going to help them uh, be a great team. So I, I had an amazing experience this year because just from the summer, just from the beginning, I just felt like it, it was the place for me to be. I felt like it was the right place at the right time. Um, two guys had just left from the transfer portal who was starting the year before, Alan Griffin and Quincy Garrier. So it kind of opened up those two forward spots. Um, and I was just hungry. I was just hungry each and every day. Um, I, I think G-Mac would tell you. I think D-Nick would tell you. Um, I was I was chomping at the bit, and that hurt me early on in the season because I was just I, I was pressing. I just wanted it so bad. I, I've been sitting I've been sitting on the bench for three years. I, I finally got my opportunity. I just I was just I just wanted it so bad. Um, so it took me about half the year to get used to playing like like myself again. Get used to playing with the freedom that Coach Beheim lets us lets us play with. Um, so it took me about half the year to really get comfortable. I had a couple good games here and there, but I I was struggling shooting the ball. Um, but I, I just I just attribute it to the work, man. I, like every single day, just just going in there, trying to get better each and every single day. Um, and like you know, we had an up and down season last year. We we were in every single game. We we're losing close games at the buzzer. We we're losing close games to throwing the ball off our legs, and it, it felt like everything that that could have went wrong went wrong for us in terms of just the, like the, that end of end of game close losses. But 
just the the mentality, the the love, the support from the coaching staff each and every day. Um, Coach Beheim getting on me, but I'm but me knowing that that he loves me and he's gonna play me and he's gonna let me play through my mistakes. Um, it, honestly, it's, it was an amazing year. Um, it, it, it's so tough because me and you as competitors, we don't like to say it's an amazing year after after a sixteen and seventeen season, but. Um, I think a lot of those guys would tell you that we were so close, close to knit throughout the year, um, that we're going to have those relationships for, rest, for the rest of our lives. And uh, I, I think just overall, it, it was it was an amazing experience for me to kind of get back on my two feet in terms of basketball. Uh, I remember after the season, um, I really wanted to come back. I mean, I, I, I told Coach Beheim, um, I, co- I told Coach Beheim, I was like, hey, if you want me back, I, I'll, I'll come back. Like, I, I, I'm, I, love, I love you guys. I have a loyalty to you guys. You guys brought my career back. And you probably would have been, would have been, would have went back for a fifth year, too, if Coach Beheim was like, Devo, I need you, man. I need you. Oh, man, that's a, that's the whole other story. I sh- sh- yeah, yeah, absolutely, bro. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just felt that love and that loyalty towards Coach Beheim. But Coach Beheim was like, no, Cole, like, you said 36 of Carolina. Like, it, it's your time to go. It's your time to go. And I was like. I, at first I was like, but you don't want me back. Like, but he's, he wasn't thinking about himself at, at the time. You know what I mean? He was thinking about what's best for you. What's best for buddy. What's, what's best for um, you in your future. So I just have so much love and respect for him. And it kind of just like, it kind of just puts my whole entire year together of like, I went throughout the year and, and the, the best thing for the program might be for me to come back. The best thing for me was was for me to go and, and be able to have this opportunity, and then now I'm on the Lakers. So I just have so much love and respect for the program. Um, I'm, it was a it was a year that changed my life, and uh, I'm just so thankful and blessed. And that's why I, I just have so much love for the for the program. Absolutely, I, I want to kind of uh, go back to what you said about you know you had those early season struggles shooting, and and we all know. Like you said, Carolina, how you went off for 36. You, you're one of the best shooters in the country, uh, you know, regardless of position. You know, obviously being 6'8", six, 6'9", six, it helps you, right, to be able to shoot the ball like that. But what was your mentality like, bro? Because, you know, we all know Coach Beheim doesn't hold back. Like, he's going to he's gonna say what he's feeling, and he's not really thinking about how you're feeling at that moment. Yeah. Uh, some, some guys crumble under that. Some guys take it as motivation – um, to go out there and, and kind of prove a point and, and uh, you know, get better with their play. So what was your mentality, you know, when you're having those early season struggles, coaches on you, you know, what did you really have to do to keep yourself locked in? Yeah, so I remember, I think it was after the VCU game, I went like two for 14, 0 for 7 from 3, uh, had a really tough game. Um, Coach Beheim was getting on me after the game. Like, Buddy, I think Buddy had 20 points, Joe played, like Joe was, he had a little point guard in, like on him the whole entire time. Um, and I felt like, and that's like, not no, no one player loses a game, but in that, in that time, I felt like I kind of lost the game. After the game, he's getting on me. Um, and then I walk into film later and uh, Coach Beheim goes, you know, you know, like you're still going to play the whole game, right, son? Like, like I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not taking you out. Um, so like, from that moment on, I knew every single time he got on me that like it was it was just to motivate me in the moment. And mm-hmm. I, I feel like me, you, D- Demetrius, G Mac, like, like we're all wired a little a little crazy. So like like in, in terms of session of work. So it's like every single time Coach Bayham would go at me after I, I would look at him like, I got you. Like, like and then he respects that <laughs> his players yeah. too. Like, I, I would just I would be so pissed at him sometimes. I remember there was a game where he was getting on me. He was like, come on, son. It was actually the last game of the year, like the Duke game. We were, uh, he's like, you're the number one option now. Buddy's out. You're the number one option. You're just going to let your team down like this? Like, he's just, like, looking at me, just just yelling at me. And, and I'm like, and I just, and I just like, give him this, like, this angry growl. He's like, all right. You know what I mean? Like, when, when, you, when he respects you to a certain point that he knows that you're going to give it all you got, you're going to lay it all on the line for, for Syracuse and the program and, and, the, and the players that came before him, like, then, then, then he's good. He's good. He's going to let you go out there and play. So I learned that after that moment against VCU. So my mindset after that was just, it's, it, they're going to fall. I'm one of the best shooters in the country. Like I'm, I, it's going to fall. I think a big moment for me was me and Demetrius really said it as a, as a shooter. If you have a routine that you go to every single day, it creates consistency, right? So me and Demetrius after like the first like 10 games, 11 games, 
we create a routine that we did every single day before practice, before games. And I feel like that kind of like helped me each and every day just kind of get a consistent routine. The shots started falling after that. Like the work will never fail, man. It, it, it might not come at, at your timing, um, exactly. but it's going to pay, pay off. If that's tomorrow, if that's 10 games down the line, or if that's two years down the line, like the work will always show. So, um, yeah, man, I, my, my, my mentality is like, as a shooter, you have to be strong. Like you have to have a strong mentor. You're going to go over six, some games, but you're going to go six for eight, the next game. So it, it's all part of it, man. Yeah. That, that That's wise words, bro. Especially for a lot of up and coming players who, you know, you're going to struggle. You're going to have ups and downs. That's a part of the game. And it, you know, if you can handle it the correct way, um, then usually you're going to make it out on top. And then, you know, to be able to learn from a guy like D Nick, a guy who's been through it, you know, he, he, he went through those first two years where he didn't play. And then, you know, I remember when I came in, you know, his junior and senior year, you know, that's when he, you know, now he's all big East cause he stuck to the, you know, the hard work, you know, he, he, he didn't give in to when coach Beheim was getting on him. He, he took it as motivation, you know, like you were talking about. Um, so he's, you know, to be able to lock in with him, he's one of the best guys to be able to learn from. So that's uh, wise words, bro, for sure. So, I, bro, I want to I want to kind of um, now get into uh, getting picked up by L.A. You know, you you leave Cuse, uh, y- you go to um, Vegas for summer league. Uh, and, and, bro, you talk about shooting the shit out of the ball. You shooting the shit out of the ball like you, you really, you know, people knew you could shoot it. But you really opened up some eyes because how you played in Vegas outside on the perimeter, being at your size, being able to do one, two dribbles. And, and you know more than anybody now in the league, that's all it is. It's nothing crazy. If you can get to your spot, pull up, you know, being at, at your height, making shots, you're going to give yourself a chance. So so talk about, you know, your mindset going into Vegas, knowing that, hey, I, I'm one of the best shooters and, and I want to show these guys that I could play and, and shoot the ball on this level. So talk about that whole experience going into there and then eventually, um, you know, heading into training camp. Yeah, man, I, I think the biggest thing for me was I didn't let my momentum slip from the end of the year at Syracuse, right? Like 36 in Carolina, 28 in the, in the, uh, against Florida State, 15 against Duke. Like I, I, I wanted to keep that momentum going. So, I mean, I didn't take a day off after the season. Like, I was just so motivated and hungry. I was like, these guys are playing in the final four. Like I, I'm supposed to be there. Like I'm like, I'm, I'm going to keep working. So like, I'm, there's no fall off. There's no slippage. Um, so it went right, right after the season. Uh, I, I actually did, did a week, two weeks at school. And then I went to um, Portsmouth Invitational. Portsmouth Invitational was like, is like the senior showcase. Did, I don't, I don't, did you play in it? I didn't because I, so I left my junior year. So I didn't, I didn't um, play in the, yeah. Yeah, so I, I ended up playing a Portsmouth Invitational, and then my uh, and then right after that I went out to Santa Barbara, started working out my agency. So working on my agency, then I started doing these NBA workouts, and these NBA workouts you're going to be against guys that you see all the time who who receive more hype than you, who everyone says is better than you. Um, and during that time, I, I went in there and I started killing everyone in these workouts. Like I went from being like a on nobody's radar to like, all right, now we're talking about second round. Now we're talking about two way talks. Now we're talking about, you know what I mean? All these, all these different stuff. So um, did, did these workouts for a month and a half. I felt like I, I had like three or four teams that, that I, I could really go to a team told me that they, if they went to the second round, um, which they ended up doing that, that, that they were going to draft me, whatever, whatever. So on draft night, uh, the draft night comes and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there with all my family, my friends, everyone's over my house. Um, and then I get the call from the Lakers. Uh, I, I thought it was either going to be the Bucks, the Kings, the the Trailblazers, the Hawks, or the Lakers were the five teams that, that I knew that were really interested in me. Talking to my agent, whatever. The Lakers call me like with like three picks left in the draft. Like, hey, Cole, like, uh, would you like to take a two way? And I was like, yeah. I felt like I just got drafted. I yeah, like yeah, I no doubt. <laughs> so that kind of validated my whole entire process throughout the draft process. Like I, I didn't let any slippage happen. So that gave me the confidence to go into Vegas. Like, all right, like I, I validated everything that I did at Syracuse and, and, and throughout the, and throughout the, the pre-draft process. And then I went into uh summer league with just the ultimate confidence. Like, all right, now, now I'm one of the best players in the team. Like I'm, I'm a two way. I'm, I'm here for a reason. Um, and the Lakers 
uh, honestly just started running the offense through me after I, after they saw I started making some shots. So um, they gave me the confidence. They gave me the 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 like the same thing almost Coach Mayhem gave me. He's like, you're going to go out there, you're going to play. Like, don't worry about coming out of the game. Like, And in the NBA, all the minutes are scheduled too, even in the summer league. So it's like, I'm scheduled to play 24 minutes no matter what. Okay. So, so oh, wow. I, was, uh, I was really appreciative of the opportunity. And then I just, I don't know, I, it kind of just picked up from that mindset after. It's like, all, all these guys were rated ahead of me. These guys got drafted. Um, and I, I was just really, really excited. So, and then, then I had a great point guard with me as well, Scotty Pippen Jr. That's that's my best friend on the team. He he, uh, it's always nice playing with a good point guard. There's nothing like it. So, uh, he took care of me, and and I, I was just knocking down shots. No doubt. So you so you know that summer league really kind of solidified it. I know you you're already on a two way, but you know when you play well in summer league. And especially in Vegas, Vegas is the top summer league. You know, they got Orlando and they got, I think, Utah or whatever, but Vegas is the top summer league. So when you you, you played the way you did in Vegas, you really solidified yourself as a, as a NBA player. Like, I know you were, but now you're like, hey, like I'm knocking down shots against other NBA guys. Like, I'm an NBA player, right? Summer league. Now we go into training camp, which is a whole other monster from, from summer league, right? Because the summer league is – you know, guys are, you know, the rookies and, and guys trying to make the team. But a lot of those guys, honestly, they won't be in the NBA from summer league, right? So now when you go to training camp and you go to training camp with L.A., you walk in the building, you, you got LeBron James, you know, uh, Russell Westbrook, Anthony Davis, uh, you know, guys like that. I mean, what first would be once you kind of came down and be like, God damn, I'm in here with, you know what I'm saying? What was that that mindset in uh you know, that kind of approach you had going into training camp. Yeah, man. So uh, we had two weeks off of the summer league and then we came right back August 1st to start training for training camp. Um, so when I came back August 1st, like I was I was still like just hungry. You know what I mean? Like now, now I'm playing against NBA guys every single day. We're starting to play pickup. We're starting to do these different things. So I'm playing against all, like none of the vets are coming and playing pickup, but um, all the young guys who are on the team, I'm, I'm playing, I'm killing, I'm, I'm, I'm playing well, I'm, I'm doing my thing, I'm still shooting the ball at a really high level. Um, and it, it, honestly, I just kept on my momentum. Um, so then as, as the month start keeps, keeps going on and on, more, more guys come in, more guys come in. And then training, training camp happens. Uh, and LeBron was there pretty much the whole entire month of August. And it's 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 a, it was just amazing just to be around him, his presence and, and just see like his work like every single morning he got to the gym at at, at 6 30 6 45 he's in the weight room stretching seven o'clock he's on the court Se seven o'clock to 7 50 he's, he's working out and then he'll do his lift he'll get a massage he'll, a cold tub uh, if he needs something else he'll get something else and then, then he'll leave and then he'll probably do like i mean you saw how many commercials he's in like <laughs> It's, it's unbelievable. Like his schedule is so packed. And just to see like that professionalism was like every single day I'm getting there at 630, no matter what, like, and he lives like 40 minutes away from the facility too. So like he's, he's on a, such a strict schedule. Um, seeing AD in the summer, like just, just connecting with those guys, bonding with those guys. Um, they've been great. And then Russ, Russ is the, it was funny. The first time I met Russ, I walked in the practice studio at like five o'clock. I was coming to get some extra shots up and Russ was in there. He just got done with his lift. And uh, he was like, I saw Coach Beheim at Summer League. He, he told me to take care of you. So I'm going to take care of you, man. Like, and, and that was just like one of those things where just like the Syracuse connection, like Coach Beheim, the Hall of Famer, having the respect of, of Russ. So, so every now, like now, every single time I, every single time I see Russ, he, he's like, what's up, shooter? You know what I mean? He, he's taking care of me. He's showing me the ways. Any questions I got, just get like, you know what I mean? Just, just throw them out there. So. Um, yeah, I mean, training, training camp's a whole different beast, man. You start playing preseason games and being a rookie two-way, you kind of get in in that fourth quarter. So you got to be able to prepare yourself those first three quarters or the, that first half for, for being, a, for, for preparing your legs, preparing your mental. It's like, all right, like as a shooter, like I'm not, I'm not going to play in the first half, but I got to make sure I'm mentally ready to go. So when I get in the game, I, I, I have the opportunity to, to, to come back the next game and, and still bring that same effort and attitude. So um, it was definitely different. It was definitely a different type of mental strength you had to have had in those moments, but you know, training camp was great. Um, 
really show me what a lot of these guys do to prepare. So, and that, that's what I'm all about is preparation and, and, and seeing LeBron and AD and Russ prepare is, I don't think there's better people to learn from. So I, I would, I guess I would take that. Is that the one biggest thing that you, you took from those guys is, is their preparation and how they really, you know, pre prepare themselves for the season? Yeah, I, I would say that. And then obviously just the basketball IQ of, of LeBron. I, I just, it, it's, it's amazing each and every day, just, just hearing those guys go back and forth on different ball screen coverages, different ways to defend different actions and all these different things. The personnel, they know every single weakness and strength of every single player in the NBA. He could be the 14th guy, or he could be the best player. Or he, it could be Paul George, or it could be freaking Buddy Bayheim. You know what I mean? Like they, they know every single strength and weaknesses of every single player. It, it's unbelievable. So just that basketball IQ, just being prepared every single game and knowing like, that's why LeBron plays till he's 38. You know what I mean? Like he's playing at a high level at this, because obviously he takes care of his body, does that at a high level, but he knows how to manipulate the game within the game. And you being a basketball trainer, you know that more than anyone. It's like, how do you manipulate the game within the game and seeing certain certain things, certain tendencies of guys, knowing that this guy doesn't shoot well from the left corner so I can help him a little bit more. So it's, it's just like, it's just unbelievable just to learn from those guys. And I, I've just been a sponge. I've just been trying to take, take as much as I can because for me, I'm not the most athletic guy. I, I got blessed with being a 6'9", but for me to stay in the league, it's going to be that mental, it's going to be that mental stuff. You know what I mean? Shooting the basketball at a high level, playing a role, and then, and then mentally on defense, just knowing everything. So it's just been amazing to learn from those guys. And I don't think people really understand how hard, like, all those little details is to retain. You know what I'm saying? Because it's so, like, the game is at such a fast pace, right? Especially especially in the NBA, it's, it's damn near a track meet. And it, it doesn't matter if it, you know, if it's a point guard or the center, those guys are fast, they're sprinting. So to be able to like retain all those little things, like you, you said, like, oh, I can help in off this guy because he doesn't shoot well from the left corner or, or, you know, I could help in a little bit more right here. This guy is not, he can't pass with his left hand or to be able to yeah. retain that in, in the, in that moment in the game when everything's going on, like that's hard, bro. That, that That's hard to do. Like, I don't think people were, and then you, you talked about, because now like you, you're in a role, like you're, 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 you got to come in and produce right away. Like for real, like in, in, and even like when you haven't played the whole game, you might get in for that five to seven minutes. And for that five to seven minutes, they're expecting you to, to produce and make shots regardless of, you know, if you haven't played the whole game, it could be the fourth quarter, you know, we got five minutes left. You got to come in and, and hit shot. Talk about like the mindset for that and how hard that is because, you know, we hear guys, you know, younger guys complaining about not playing in college. And when you get to the NBA, man, you, you're going to be lucky to even, you know, get any type of type of minutes. So, like, when you do get in, you really have to take advantage of that opportunity that you're getting. Yeah, man, I, I, th I think the biggest I think Villanova really mentally trained me for that. Like I, I was. It, it was tough because at the time, like you don't you don't ever want to be the sixth man you don't ever want to be the guy who who's kind of looked to next but it, it prepared me so much mentally that I've been through so much in college mentally about obviously the preparation the the scouting report so you got to know everything about every single player so that that was instilled in me um but also I knew at Villanova if I made a mistake on the defensive end I'm coming out of the game so I had to be I had to be on the whole entire time where at Syracuse I mean coach Bayham was gonna let me play 35 minutes good, good, bad, or ugly. So yeah. um, it was one of those things where I, I was mentally trained at Villanova to know that it's like, I'm on a short leash, but at the same time, it was, how do you know that, but play with the confidence I did at Syracuse. So you have to find that, that mesh and balance of, of trusting your work, trusting the process, doing all the things that you need to do to, to know in the moment that whatever happens, happens. Like it, it's, 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 already destined before we're meant to be that like before we're there like everything that's happened is meant to happen before so I just think going in in those moments like I, I put in all the work I put in all the time I've, I've done the things I need to do I'm, I'm I'm in depth with the scouting report I've watched film in this team um so let's let's, let's go and play and see what happens man yeah like, like I I just I, I I get so excited with competing like I I, I love it it fuels me it, it's gonna no matter what happens, I'm, I'm still going to be back in the gym the next day. Like LeBron talks about all the time. He's like, it's, it's an 82 game season in college. Like if we, if we lose a game, our heads are down. We're, like we're, we're, we're upset. Like in the NBA, you don't have time to be upset. You're right. You have to go back, watch film, prepare, get your shots up, do your treatment, get a massage, 
and then you have a game the next day. I remember we played against Sacramento Kings in my first preseason game. I had a pretty good game. Um, I think I had like 10 points or something like that. I played like 15 minutes, but I had 10 points. Um, shot the ball well. After the game, everyone in the locker room was just like sit, and we ended up losing by like 20 or something like that. We get blown out in the second half. So I, I'm in that college mindset of like, damn, man, like, like freaking lost. Like, like the coaches aren't gonna like play me after all the coaches are coming up to me after great game, Cole, great game. Wait, 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 way to step up, way, way to do your thing. And I'm like, like, I'm I'm used to like after a loss, like it being the end of the world. Like these guys are thinking for 82 games, like they don't. Like that, that one immediate result isn't going to be like great NBA teams lose 30 games in a season. Like, yeah. and, and me, me, me and you, like, I, I barely lost 30 games in my college career. So, yeah. it, <laughs> yeah. so it's just a different mindset, it's a different mentality. It's like you have to get over things quick. And that's what makes the great players great. Like, LeBron's not stressing over a loss in October. You know what I mean? Like, he, it's just a process for him. It's, it's how much better can his team get throughout the season? So, I, I know it was a long form answer, but I, I just think just, just the preparation at the end of the day, it's all about preparation and preparing your mind. I mean, we, we, we've talked about it before when I worked out with you, like we talked about meditation, we talked about preparing the mind, doing all these things to, to, I think the, the mind is, is everything. And yeah. when you're preparing the mind and you're not, a, you're not afraid of failure, you're, you're going to be in a good spot no matter what. Yeah. A hundred percent, bro. It, it, it's like you, putting faith and belief in, in like what you're talking about, your hard work, your, your preparation. And you don't know what's going to happen. Right. But you know that if you continue to, you know, believe in yourself, believe in your work, believe in your preparation, it usually works out. You know, it's going to be bumps in the road. All that's just how it goes. And then, you know, we adjust as that happens, but no, I think that that was, that was a perfect answer, bro. So besides, you know, obviously LeBron, AD, you know, Russ, though, you see those guys every day, and I'm sure you've you've had a lot of wow moments like like I can't believe this. But other than those guys, what NBA player has really kind of left you with your jaw dropping like, oh, man, like this is this is unbelievable. Like whether it be athleticism, skill wise, you know, it, it could be whatever. Yeah, man, I, Dame Lillard, number one, like we, we played him and we, we were I think we were up like 10 with like a minute and 45 left and he just took over the game. Like he was like, the, ball, the ball's in my hands. Like it, it, you couldn't do anything to stop him. It was, it was unreal. And that's one of the things in the NBA is like, sometimes you play really good defense, but the players are so good. They're going to make the shot. Yeah. And and that's what I've noticed more than anything. It's like, I mean, me, me and you, like guys can play great defense on us, but we can, we're still going to make the shot. Like it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, like you're playing against really good players every single day. So Sometimes you can't get mad if a guy makes a shot. Obviously, if you let someone blow by you, if, if you're not if you're not disciplined, if you're fouling guys, that's different. But if you're making guys take tough shots, um, then 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 that's what that's what you need to do. Yeah, uh, I would say Devin Booker is another guy who, who who's just unbelievable. And then then there's the obvious guy, Steph Curry. Like St Steph Curry is just unbelievable. We played against him the first night. He didn't even have a great game, but just his movement on the court. Like I. I I watch all that stuff in terms of just like the, the freedom of movement on the court. Like he's, he's throwing the ball, running the other side of the court, throwing the ball back, dribbling three times, throwing it back, coming up for another handoff, like get, getting a shot off, like cash. Like it's yeah. just that, that's just so, that's a, that's great for me. It was, that was amazing for me to see. So, I mean, those three guys, but I mean, every single team you, you play against is there's, there's a six man who, who, who have 30 points, you know what I mean? And you're like, all right, this guy could start on any other team, but he's going to just come in here. And so, uh, I mean, NBA is a great league, man. There's a lot of talent, <laughs> a lot, a lot of talent, but those three guys that you named, obviously, you know, three of the top guys in the league, but like, they're not guys where their athleticism like jumps off the chart at you. Like oh. those three guys you named, like their skill, is unbelievable like the footwork like you talked about like Steph Curry running off screens the condition that you have to be in like if you want to be good like in the NBA at that size like your skill level your condition has to be on a whole nother level because you know you guys you got six ten six nine guys who are jumping out of the gym they already got a I guess a head up on people because they, that, they of those God given abilities but these guys like I remember Steph like Steph came out with me Steph's littler than me yeah. You know what I mean? So that's what makes it so amazing when you watch what they're doing. And 
and it and it goes back to like you said the preparation the hard work the beliefs in themselves like they're doing it times 20 like these like these kids these younger kids and, and we'll kind of i'll ask you a question um later about that but these younger kids they don't really get it and really understand like the the hard work you have to put in and even then like i tell them all the time even then bro it might not happen no. you know what i'm saying you, you have to have that in your mind so like that's something you're dealing with all the time hey i could work out twice a day for this for this long amount of time and it still might not happen you you have to have that you know that faith and belief in yourself that hey i'm gonna i'm gonna do it anyway you know what i mean so that's that those three guys that you named like three of my favorite players too bro like just it's it's incredible like when you watch them like you said the how they move their body like people don't understand that like how, the footwork the stop and go to be able to stop on a dime and turn and still have the balance to go up like that you know that stuff is not looked at and people don't understand how hard you know that is to be able to have those things so yeah just, i mean it's just amazing to be able to get kind of a a front front and center and see those guys and and then that like you said that helps you with with your game you you add you know that's what great players do they add from the the, the players that they see and you know, take what they think they can implement into their game. So, uh, yeah, uh, unbelievable, bro. So, bro, I want to get uh talk about Coach Ham real quick. And it's funny because Coach Ham is from Michigan. Michigan guy, yep. Grew up in Saginaw, Michigan. I grew up in Bay City, Michigan, which is like five minutes. Okay. I, you know, I knew D. Ham growing up because I used to go watch him play. My dad used to go take me and watch him play. And he, you know, growing up, he was breaking backboards, doing all that. You know what I mean? And one of the, just one of the best dudes. And, you know, I, uh, you know, I know his son, his son is a coach now as well, but just talk about playing for, for coach ham. I know he's a player's coach, you know, he's been in the league. He's, he's experienced, you know, everything that, uh, you know, you guys are experiencing now having won a championship, um, you know, just to, as a player, just talk about him and, and his coaching style and, um, what he really brings to the table as a coach. Yeah. He's been unbelievable towards me, man. I mean, he, he loves running plays for shooters, which, which makes, which makes the marriage great. So uh, <laughs> I, I think just from the, from the first night that, that he called me on draft night too, he, he wanted to make sure he, that he, that he, uh, I heard his voice that, that he was being presented and, and I'm a two way, I'm a rookie. You know what I mean? Like he didn't have, he didn't have to do that, but he's brought me out to lunch. He, he's made sure that, that our relationship is, is solid through this whole entire process. So he, he's, he's been an amazing person for me for my rookie year just having that that opportunity to just to learn from him uh be like he's in the gym every single day in August with us like a lot of head coaches are, are probably having vacation because they're having an 82 game season so um he, he's been an amazing amazing person in my life just in terms of just giving me confidence making sure that 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 he knows that I'm, I'm there uh, he's there for me um and then I, I think he's just grown as a coach I mean he's he's learned from these guys as well like I, th I think sometimes like our ego is such a, such a powerful thing, right? Like he has yeah. no ego when it comes, he's just trying to win. And, and, and that's, and that's what I, I've just gotten from him. Just, just doing whatever it takes. Like he's been in that situation. He's, and he was an undrafted guy, just like me. So it, we can relate in that aspect where a guy like, I mean, AD and Braun and all these guys, they were number one picks. So like it, it, Russ was a top five pick. So, it, or a top 10 pick. So it was just one of those things where it's like, he relates to me more in my process than, than maybe some of those other guys. So honestly, it's, it's been a great relationship. He's, he's an amazing coach, amazing guy, amazing father, amazing husband. Um, and honestly, just, just a great role model to look up to in life. Never, never mind basketball. So um, he, he understands it. He, he's, he comes from a, comes from a pedigree of, of winning basketballs in, in Milwaukee. So uh, with the coach Bud um, and he's instilled a lot of those principles and, and, and made sure his presence has been felt in practice and games. And, and I think even over these first 20 games, he's really grown as a coach and he's had to deal with a lot of adversity in these first 20 games too. Um, obviously when you, when you coach LeBron, you coach AD there's, there's, and coach for the Lakers, there's going to be a lot of spotlight on you. And I, I, I think he, he's grown a lot throughout, throughout these, like I said, these first 20 games, not, not only as, as a coach X to nose wise, but, but being able to deal with personalities, being able to talk to guys in, in certain situations, be able to coach guys differently. Um, so, I mean, he, he, he's been great. Yeah. I mean, the great coaches, they, they learn from their players. Like they, they listen to their players and they implement it into their game plan. And that's how you gain that trust, you know, from your players. And that's how you have great teams. Last two questions, bro. I'll get you up out of here. Um, so first one is, 
it's kind of like off, not about basketball. It's more so about, you know, being in LA and obviously LA, you know, you, you see Hollywood celebrities and that, but you got like three of the biggest outside of basketball, these LeBron, AD, Russ, those guys are, are celebrities, right? So, you know, how is that kind of like, uh, you know, just being around that, you know, I'm sure you, you've you seen, um, you know, some, some crazy people around the facility, um, you know, Bron, I'm sure he brings in different people and AD. So, you know, just talk about that, like, you know, they're, the whole circle that they're around and, um, you know, seeing those type of people, how, how has that really been? And how have you, uh, um, I guess, uh, you know, dealt with that type of stuff? Yeah, it's been, it's been unreal, man. I, I think in terms of like our generation of, like obviously it was Michael Jordan and Kobe and then and like, it's been like LeBron. You know what I mean? Like those three guys, like whenever LeBron goes somewhere, like everyone's phone phone comes out. You know what I mean? If if he if he walks in a movie theater, a club, a, a basketball game, a freaking baseball game, a high school football game, like everyone just stands up and it's like, oh my god, like that's a that's a person. Like like people start crying when they see this man. Like <laughs> and it's, and it's um, like AD and Russ obviously have like diehard fans like that, but like everyone's like that for LeBron. Love him, hate him, um, respect him. Don't don't like him for the decision. Like. It, it's just unbelievable to be around that presence. Like every single arena we go to, like it, it's honestly tiring. Like he has to have three security guards with him at all time. He obviously puts so much work and in, in preparation into his body that like, that's his main focus. But then every single place he goes to, he has to be on. Like he can't, he can't randomly talk to like, like a friend because then that friend's going to be like on TMZ or something. Like, you know what I mean? Like he has to be so aware of, of, of where he is in the moment that it's just like just to constantly be on like I think a lot of people like wish that but like they don't understand what comes with it right like for him not to be in any sort of like drama or anything outside of basketball where, where people dislike him is honestly 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 like probably one of the greatest feats of all time <laughs> like, yeah so I think just just being around LeBron I've just really noticed or I've just really like came to appreciate like me being able to go to a, a, a grocery store and not have people with their phones out, you know what I mean? Or, or being able to walk around LA. Um, like, so I, I mean, LeBron is, he's a different level of superstar and, and, and stardom. Like he's not just a basketball player. He's like a generational icon. Like yeah. when, when we go back, we're going to be talking about LeBron and AD and Russ, like they have, a, they have a couple of security guards with them because obviously like they, they have crazy fans too, but it's just crazy. Like, like, LeBron is everyone comes out to see him you know what I mean like it's we, we could be playing in Detroit it'll be sold out we could play we, we could be playing in Orlando it's gonna be sold out just because LeBron's there so I would just say being around LeBron is just it, it, it almost doesn't feel real at times because like this guy I idolized growing up you know what yeah. I mean like I, I I remember the 2018 the 2018 playoff run that he had I was glued to the tv just watching him like I, I, so just being around him is definitely a different different type of stardom yeah it'd be hard to live your life like that like you said it, it's the it's so impressive that you know all, over all these years he's he's never had a you know got in trouble or like a you know a scandal or something it's always seems like something's going on so for him to be able to you know live his life like that with all that attention on him first of all like you said going to the movie theater I, that'd be like come on man can, can I just get a break where I could exactly take my you know what I mean? Take my family out, take my kids. And now you talk about his kids, you know, his, uh, what's his name goes out. He's getting the, the same type of attention. So it's, you know, just imagine them two together. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable feat. Like you said, to be able to stay on track while you have all that, you know, I guess, nonsense from the outside. So yeah. unbelievable. Last question, bro. I'm gonna get you up out of here. I, I kind of want to touch on what we, uh, we talked about earlier about, about the kids and what it really takes um you know not not to get to the nba because that's you know bro that's that's hard that's like almost nearly impossible to be able to get there right and it's shit, damn near impossible to play on that college level at a, at a high level you know what i mean so what's your advice for i guess kids coming up who have dreams of you know playing in college playing the nba what 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 is a few things that they really have to understand and one thing that you would really want to let them know going forward. Yeah, man, I, I would just say, like, 
just fall in love with the process, fall in love with the work, man. I, I know, I know it sounds cliche, but it's, it's true. Like when I was at Villanova and I wasn't playing that much, like I, I didn't know if I was going to make it to the NBA. You know what I mean? I didn't like, that wasn't something that I, I knew was going to happen for sure. I didn't know I was going to end up going to Syracuse, but like what, one thing I like people will tell you, like I was the hardest worker at Villanova. I was the hardest, I, th- I, I consider myself the hardest worker at Syracuse. Um, and just that every day, like that process, that grind, that like there's no telling like what one year can do for you. You know what I mean? Like I, I know people who have dedicated themselves to the process for one year and gotten a division two scholarship. You know what I mean? Like I, I know people who have dedicated themselves for, at starting late that have made it to low major division one. So it's like, I'm not saying that's, that's the, that's the, that's the, the guidelines for everyone, but, but I've never seen a person who works really, really hard, not achieve something of, of, of greatness to, to what they can get to. And you could probably say the same, like I've never seen someone who, who really loves the game, who goes every single day with, with intention and attitude and, and really wants to get better every single day, who's hit, hitting up the person nonstop, or like if that's you, if that's GMAC, if that's D Nick, if that's another trainer in Syracuse, it's hitting up nonstop, thinking about the game, obsessing over the game, not receive what they like, what, what they're entitled to, right? Yeah. Or, or what, what they want. So I would just say, just fall in love with the process, man. Fall, like, like everyone's time is going to be different. Like, like everyone's story is different. Everyone's path is different to get to that level. Don't compare yourself to others because that's the thief of joy, man. Comparison is the thief of joy. Like, I remember after my freshman year of college, I'm looking around the country like this and that, and I'm like stressing over like, oh my goodness, like, like how am I not here? I was rated over this guy, that guy. Like, I'm not getting the opportunity. But like, just just stay stay true to your path. One of, one of my teammates has a great, like he he lives his life by just run your own race. You know what I mean? Just run your own race. Don't, don't look at the guy next to you. Just keep on running. So um, as, as cliche as it sounds, fall in love with the process, man. Like it's, it's, it's not gonna, it's not going to be all ups. Like, and usually when you have a lot of success, like usually you're humbled again. You know what I mean? Yes. So, so don't be, don't be frustrated by that. Like, even like, like even a guy like, like Jerry McNamara, right? Like, like he had an, unbelievable college, like probably one of the best college careers in, in the history of college basketball and then he had to start again at, at the at the d-league level you know what i mean like so like everyone everyone is going to get humbled at some time so like don't take offense to that just just fall in love with it even more and the people who fall in love with it usually make it to the top yeah great great advice you, you have to love what you do and, and i like what you said um, the word intention comes to mind you, you have to be have intention with what you want to do and then take those steps to get towards that goal and give yourself a chance. Like we said early on, it, it might not happen, but you know, when you have intent and you work towards the, you know, put those steps in front and work towards what you want to get to, usually good things happen along the way. Even if you don't get there, you meet great people along the way, uh, you form great habits. Um, and then usually it can take you off into another path to have success in that path. So um, no, a hundred percent, bro. I, I appreciate you coming on. Yo, make sure you tell uh, Coach Ham I said what's up. Make sure you tell my guy Coach Handy I said what's up. That's my guy Phil. Like he's yes, he's good people, man. So uh, keep doing your thing, Cole. I appreciate you hopping on. Um, get healthy. I know you like you said you chomping at the bit, waiting to get back out there on the floor and play. Um, and, and just keep doing keep doing your thing. Keep getting better, bro. You know I'm cheering for you. I'm rooting for you. And um, hopefully we can have you come back on later on, and and we'll chop it up again, man. I appreciate you, bro. Oh, yeah, man. Thanks for having me on, man. Always the Q's family is so strong, man. So anytime you guys need me, I'm, I'm here, man. Just always, um, I'm, I'm orange for life, man. Always. Appreciate you, bro.